Flying Classroom, we're about to embark on another expedition. What I'm holding in my hand is a pearl necklace. Do you know how pearls are formed? How exactly did they start? Well, believe it or not, pearls first start off as a parasite inside of a clam. On this expedition, I'm going to travel to San Francisco to explore the world of parasites and work with fellow National Geographic explorer Anand Varma. I can't wait to show you guys and experience the world of parasites, why they're important, and what impact does this have on us in our everyday lives. Hey Barrington. Anand, how you doing man? Good, welcome to my workshop. I've got some really cool stuff to show you today. Come on Awesome, in. this is amazing. My name is Anand Varma. I'm a science photographer and explorer with National Geographic. Well, so I learned these amazing stories of these powerful tiny little bugs that can do amazing things. And so I wanted to teach people about the stories of these parasites. And so I figured out how to take interesting photographs of them. And specifically, you know, so many people think bugs are gross and parasites are like the grossest of all the bugs. So I thought, okay, that's true, they're gross. But if I can make a beautiful picture, maybe I can convince people to be curious enough so that they could learn more about the biology of these amazing creatures. So I'm using photography as a way to, to bridge this divide across people's aversion, their, their, their sense of grossness about these animals. A parasite is a creature that lives inside or on another creature and feeds on it or harms it in some way. Okay, so you know those crickets that were on your shoulder? Yeah. They get infected by a parasite called a horsehair worm. And what that horsehair worm does is it gets into the body of the cricket, it grows up in its insides, and then when it's ready to come out, it forces the cricket to find water and drown itself because that worm has to come out in water. So we've got this worm living in a creek or a puddle, it's swimming around, it's finding a mate, it's laying eggs. It can never leave that creek, but its eggs can. The eggs hatch and they get into something like a mosquito larva. It lives in that mosquito larva, the mosquito transforms into an adult and it carries those little baby worms inside of it. it. Flies around, it dies somewhere in the forest, and that's where those little crickets come in. And once it gets in the cricket, it hatches, and it grows inside the cricket. The cricket doesn't know it. It's just crawling around, thinking it's living a normal life, and that worm's growing longer and longer and longer. And when that worm wants to come out, it can't come out on land. It's gotta find water so it doesn't dry out. Ugh, yeah, makes your skin yeah. crawl. So how do you find water when you're inside of a cricket that's on land? Well, this little worm has figured out how to force the cricket to find water and drown itself. You know, as creepy as this looks, this actually gives a better understanding of parasites to think this worm figured out a way to entrap itself inside the body of a cricket and figure out how to find a new home, how to find a new place to inhabit. One of the most interesting parasites that I've learned about and I photographed is a kind of wasp. It's a really tiny wasp, maybe a quarter of the size of your thumb. It attacks ladybugs. All right, so the next one I'm gonna show you, this is another totally different kind of parasite. So this is much tinier now. Is that a ladybug? Yeah, this is a ladybug. So what, what, is, what you see here, there's this like funny little fuzzy lump there. What it's standing on top of is the cocoon of a parasitic wasp. That ladybug was stung by an adult wasp. And that wasp stings it and injects a single egg into the belly of that ladybug. And the egg hatches as a baby wasp. That baby feeds on the insides of the ladybug. And then, when it's ready to come out, it squeezes its way out of the ladybug, and then spins a cocoon, 
which is a kind of house that protects it as it grows up into an adult. But inside of that little house, that cocoon, it can't run away, it can't protect itself from predators. So it's figured out how to force this ladybug to become its bodyguard. So the ladybug stands on top of the cocoon and it fights off any other bugs that would come and eat the baby wasp. The scientists have known about these examples of parasites that control the minds of their hosts for many years. And they know many, many examples, hundreds of different examples of different parasites that control their hosts in different ways. And the host is the animal that the parasite lives inside of or on top of. But they don't know as much about how these parasites are able to do it. And there are many different scientists looking at different aspects of how this mind control works. But there's still a lot more questions to answer about how this happens. All right, Barrington, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one more example of a mind controlling parasite. This one's really cool. So here, take this one. Just hold it by the leaf, and I'll take another one out here. Is this an ant? That is an ant. Okay, so these are a couple different ants that have been infected by fungus. And so this long stalk with a little poofy end there, there's something there that's coming out of the back mm -hmm. of the ant's head. These are both Ophiocordyceps fungus that have taken over the bodies and minds of these ants. In the Brazilian Amazon, these fungi get into the body of the ant and then they force the ant to crawl off the forest floor and then bite down onto this leaf that you're holding. Wow. So it's getting the ant to go do a thing it never would have done in its normal life. The reason that it's forced this ant off the forest floor is that when it releases those cloud of spores, they can travel further through the forest. And so it's manipulating the behavior of this ant so that it can get up into the canopy of the forest and spread itself way more efficiently than if it was still stuck on the ground. Scientists estimate between one third and one half of all of the animal diversity on the planet is parasites. So if you count up all of the different kinds of animals, one in three of those or one in two of those are these creatures that have figured out how to live inside of or on top of other creatures. What that means is when we think about protecting biodiversity and, and all of the different forms of life in the world, a huge chunk, maybe even half of that diversity is parasites. And people think about parasites as ooh, icky things that cause disease, like let's get rid of them. The world will be healthier if we don't have these parasites. Well, it turns out to not be true. Parasites are critical parts of the ecosystem. They make up so much of the diversity of the life out there that to remove them from, from nature, from the ecosystems, would be incredibly damaging. Every single human being on the planet has parasites on their body and inside their body. Most of these, the vast majority of these parasites are doing very small amounts of harm so that we don't notice. It's a tiny mite on your face that's eating dead skin and it's really not bothering us that much. Some parasites do cause major problems. They can cause disease and death. A really common one you may have heard of is malaria is a kind of parasite. Now the question is, are any of these parasites able to control the mind of us? The way that so many of these parasites are able to control the minds of bugs or crabs or frogs. Do any of them control our minds? Flying classroom, what a mind blowing expedition. Of all the places to learn about parasites, never once I thought it would happen in San Francisco. You see, we look at parasites as if they're a nuance, or they're just really creepy, but they're actually essential to our survival and our ecosystem. This has just been an amazing expedition filled with a number of different innovations and resources surrounding parasites. Off to our next adventure, Blue Skies.